That's what God wants us to be here in Memphis, Tennessee. We need to be a catalyst for spiritual awakening, and we do that by loving Jesus Christ. church this morning. Let's all stand up. Worship the Lord together. Glad to have you here. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Heavens declare your greatness. Oceans cry out. Join with the earth and I'll give my praise to you. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And heavens declare your greatness. Oh, cry out to you. The mountains, they bow down before you. So I join with the earth and I sing. The heavens declare your greatness. The oceans cry out to you. The mountains, they bow down before you. So I join with the earth and I give my praise.
So glad to have you guys here. Isn't it great that Jesus Christ is our living hope? Amen. Hey, why don't you turn to somebody close to you and say, hey, I'm glad to see you in church, and Jesus is our living hope.
All right, I hope you found a friend. We have four friends that are here this morning following the Lord in believer's baptism. So let's turn our attention here to the screens and let's celebrate these folks as they make this public profession. Well, good morning and thank you, Brother Steve. It's a great to be here in the baptistry this morning. I'm here with a Timothy Washington. Amen. Timothy, you got a fan club out there, buddy. That's good. Timothy, along with the others who will be baptized this morning, have repented of their sins, believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead to save them, and have received Jesus into their life as their Lord and Savior. And they've come this morning publicly to profess their faith in the Lord Jesus through believer's baptism. So, Timothy, it's my great joy to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We're buried with Jesus in baptism into death, and we are raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. God bless you, Timothy. Here you go, buddy. Take that. You're welcome. Step right over there. And this is Bella Gullion. And Bella, amen, Bella, yay. Bella gave her heart to the Lord a couple of years ago here at Bellevue on a Sunday night. She came forward uh, when the pastor gave the invitation, trusted the Lord. Well, Bella, it's my great joy to baptize you, my little sister, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We're buried with Jesus in baptism into death, and we are raised to walk in newness of life. God bless you, Bella. You love the Lord. Walk right around there now. Okay, here. Come on. Come on now. Come on right up. Walk around there. Find you there right now. Take that one. Take that one. Take that one. Walk right there. Now, this is Bella's dad, Eric Gullion. Amen. God bless you, Eric. Eric has been on staff with us here working in the culinary ministry for a few years realized uh, early on after they came to Bellevue that he really had never trusted Christ. So he did that, but then he came under conviction about needing to be baptized. So he's come today to obey the Lord and follow him in believer's baptism. So Eric, it's my great joy to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We're buried with Jesus in baptism into death, and we are raised to walk in newness of life. Amen, Eric. God bless you, brother. You love the Lord and serve Him. Go right ahead. Just turn it. Just tell everybody who you are. They cut me off and I didn't want to get out of touch. So uh, just go ahead and back up. Turn it off when the red lights come on. My name is Corey O'Hara, and I'm the middle school pastor here at Bellevue Baptist Church. And today I have Adeline Grace Baskin, who is my niece. And yeah, it's exciting. A few months ago, Adeline came forward in a very childlike way and placed her faith in Jesus Christ as her Lord in her life. And so today, it is my joy and my honor to baptize you, Adeline, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ into baptism unto death, raised to walk in newness of life. And, and all God's people.
How many of you have ever been in a hotel or a hospital or someplace and you've seen a Gideon Bible? Anybody out there? Don't you thank God for these men that give these Bibles out? And uh, they still, they go to a lot of uh, schools, they go to a lot of different places, and they are all volunteers. Nobody makes any money. They just give Bibles away all over the world. They have given away over two billion with a B Bibles, two billion Bibles uh, since they were started back in 1908. And so I wonder if we have any Gideons. If you're a Gideon, would you stand up so we can thank God for you right now? Any, do we have any Gideons in the room here? Anybody in the Gideon ministry? Is somebody standing up that I'm not seeing all right? Look at me. We need some people in the Gideon ministry, okay? We had several in the other service, but if you would like to uh, know more about how to serve in that ministry, call the church office, and we will be glad to help you. Every penny that you give will go to the Gideons, and they give that money to buy Bibles. And we're going to take up a special offering momentarily. If you'll look in your uh, bulletin, you'll see the special offering for the Gideons. It's all to give out Bibles. That's all it is. Every penny of this will go to them, not to us. And we're hoping to raise $50,000 today. We have uh, been giving around $35,000, $40,000. We want to go up to fifty dollars today. So I just want to encourage you, if you will, to think about giving to the Gideon's offering. And we'll do that momentarily. We're also going to have our regular offering in just a minute. But before we do, I want to thank the Lord for one of our staff members and his sweet wife. And I want them to come up. Jim and Donita Barnwell, they have been with us at Bellevue now for three decades. They've been here 30 years today. Let's thank the Lord for them. Amen. Jim uh, has so many things he does. I have to read them to you. He is, uh, serves as our director of communications. He provides uh, direction for graphic design all the print media, all the media relations, and so much more. He is a graduate of LSU, and uh, Donita, his wife, works in our women's ministry. They have two daughters, Beth and Blair, two granddaughters, and Blair is here today with her husband, uh, Kelsey. I just want you to know this is one of the finest people I know. Jim does a great job. He's been on site ever since I've been here. I've been with him for 12 or 13, rather, of those uh, 13 years, uh, 30 years of his, and I thank God for him. Uh, Jim, would you like to say a word? Just say a word to us. Well, I just want you to know that it's, uh, you know, ever since the Lord called us here, it's, it's just been evident all through that that it's a real honor and a privilege to be here and to be serving the Lord here at Bellevue. Uh, you know, when you come, when the Lord leads you uh, to a place, you just don't know what's going to happen and uh, what, uh, what God's going to do. Um, but uh, both of my uh, daughters were baptized here. They came to Christ here. Uh, both of them were married here. And uh, my daughter Beth is not, no, not here today. Her husband's in the Navy, and so they're in Norfolk, Virginia. But the... Uh, and then when I think of all of that, you know, Donita has been by my side, and really she deserves probably more credit than anybody <laughs> for uh, the last 30 years. And uh, yeah. <laughs> but, it, but if anybody says anything great has happened or something wonderful or something looks great, uh, all I can say is to God be the glory. He, he gets all the glory of everything that goes on. So, amen. I want to give you... I gave him this check in the last service. He gets to keep it this time, all right? Thank you, Jim. We love you and praise God for you. Let's thank the Lord one more time for this sweet cup. Amen. I'll just stay right here a second, okay? We're going to, amen. Stand up if you want to give it to him. That's good. 30 years. How about that? 30 years. Man, praise the Lord. Good job. Amen. Let's have our prayer for our offering, and you can be seated again. Father, thank you so much for, uh, Lord, this precious family. Thank you for the Barnwells and what they've done over the last three decades, Lord. We pray now that you would bless this offering, Lord, not just the Gideon offering, but our uh, regular offering as well that serves, Lord, to su supply everything that we have, Lord, here at Bellevue. We pray your blessings on it as well. Bless both the Gideon offering and our regular offering. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
face the waves. I don't want to be afraid. No, I don't want to be afraid. I don't want to fear the storm just because I hear Waiting. 
waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your hands And this is my confidence You never fail yet Never fail me yet I know the night won't Jesus, you're still This is my confidence, you never fail. 
wish you guys could hear you singing. I'm down here here listening to all y'all sing. That was powerful. Was that a great song or what? That was good, wasn't it? Amen. Amen. Take your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 15. And in just a moment, I'll begin reading at verse 7. And then if you don't mind, go ahead and turn. I, I rarely do two different texts, but uh, they're so pivotal. Uh, turn also to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. John chapter 15, verse 7, and Ephesians 6, 17 and 18. Today I want to talk to you about changing the world through praying God's Word. How many of you believe our world needs changing? Does anybody believe that? Well, we're not going to change it through uh, polit politics. We're not going to change it through finances. We're not going to change it just by talking about issues in the government. And we're not going to change it with the Supreme Court. But we are going to change this world by talking to Almighty God and not only talking with Him, but also praying Scripture. The two most powerful forces in Christianity are the Word of God and prayer. And when you put them together, you've got a dynamic duo. You've got a tandem that won't quit. When you pray the Word of God, God listens and He answers in an unusual way. John 15, verse 7, Jesus said these words the night before He was crucified. He said this, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask, everybody say ask, yes. ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Now what part of that do you not understand? If you abide in Jesus and Jesus' words abide in you while you're praying, Ask whatever you wish, and it shall be done for you. And you know what? When God's Word abides in you, you're not going to be asking for things that are outside of the will of God. And when you pray according to the will of God, He hears. And when He hears according to the will of God, He's going to answer. But the key is, you've got to ask according to His will, and the Word of God is the will of God. So when you have the Word of God abiding in you, I mean, you're living in it. You're abiding in Jesus. You're in the will of God. You're not out living a double life. You're not coming to church on Sunday and living like the devil Monday through Saturday and expecting God to bless. Look at me. God doesn't bless hypocrisy. It doesn't mean that you'll never sin again. It doesn't mean you have to be sinless. Nobody's sinless. I'm not talking about that stuff, but I am saying you've got to want to do right, and you've got to not be living a double life if you want God to answer your prayer. God is not going to answer the prayers of people that are living over here. You can't have it both ways, guys. You can't go out here and be drinking and partying, sleeping around with people that are, you're not married to. You can't live like that and expect God to answer your prayers. You can't live like that. You can't go around cursing. We used to call it cussing, whatever you want to call it talking foul language. You can't go around being negative all the time. You can't go around living in sin and expecting God to answer. But if you're trying to live for the Lord, if you're abiding in Jesus and His Word is abiding in you, you're taking in Scripture, man, you want the Word of God, you go to bed on time, you get up on time, you read the Word, you got Bible intake, you're memorizing Scripture, the Word of God is in you, the Word is abiding in you, then you can ask whatever you wish and it shall be done for you. Let me give you another verse, two verses. Ephesians 6, 17 and 18. And take, you're putting on the whole armor of God. I did this early this morning, named off all my family members, all my loved ones, prayed over all of us, the whole armor of God. And part of that is mentioned in these two verses. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And then notice, with all prayer. With all prayer. The Word of God with all prayer. Let's say that together. The Word of God with all prayer. Now let's all say it together. The Word of God with all prayer. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, 
What are you going to pray? The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Pray in the Spirit. Pray the Word of God. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance, that is steadfastness, staying with the stuff, and petition for all the saints. We're praying the Word of God. I don't know of anything more exciting than teaching somebody how to pray the Word of God. I don't know of anything that will change your life more. I don't know of anything that will move mountains more. I don't know of anything that the devil's more afraid of than praying the Word of God. So I want to encourage you to listen. This may be one of the most important sermons I'll ever share with you. I'm not trying to overstate my case. I'm not trying to speak in superlatives. You know, sometimes preachers get up and say every week, oh, this is the most important thing I've ever told you. Well, you know, you said that last week, you know, and you said it five times before that. I'm getting to where I don't really know if this is really the most important, but I'm not saying that. I'm telling you, what I'm saying to you today is vastly important if you want to be an overcomer. Now, if you just want to be one of these people that goes to church once a week, maybe once a month, and just kind of hang out with Jesus just enough so that you won't go to hell, if that's all you want, then you know what? Just do whatever you want to do. Do You know, check out, whatever you want to do, play on your phone, whatever. But if you really want to go on with God, you check in because this sermon will take you to another level in your spiritual life. This sermon will help your marriage. This sermon will help you out of the mess that sin has gotten you in. I'm telling you, what I'm going to share with you can literally change the trajectory, not just of your life, but of everybody behind you that you're leaving behind. So I want to encourage you to really listen. How many of you know we got a lot of blanks to fill in? Anybody know that? Up there? You say, how in the world? Oh, you're about to see a miracle. Here it goes. Are you ready? Get your pens out. And don't say, hey, wife, get your pen out. No, 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 sir. You get your pen out. Ladies, if you don't have one pen, give it to him right now. Give it to him right now. Don't you dare let him make you do that. All right, number one, the Bible is the Word of God. Amen. What do we believe about the Bible? We believe it's inspired. It is God-breathed. 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is inspired. The word means God-breathed. It's inspired by God. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. We believe in verbal, plenary inspiration of the Bible. Verbal, we believe the words are inspired. Not just the ideas, but the words. And we believe plenary, that all the words are are inspired. I like to tell people, I believe every book in the Bible. I believe every word in the Bible. I even believe the cover that says genuine leather. Amen. I believe it all. I believe the book of maps. I believe all of it. Amen. If God said it, I believe it. I'm not going to argue with God. I've learned not to argue with God. And so I'm just going to believe it's inspired. It's inerrant. It is, has no error in it. No error in the Word of God. Why? It was given by a perfect God who cannot err. The Bible says in Numbers 23, verse 19, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do it? Has he spoken? Will he not make it good? God is good for his word. If God says it, that settles it, whether you believe it or not. <laughs> Amen. It is the inerrant word of God. It is also infallible. Now, what does that mean? It will not in and of itself cause you to stumble. Psalm 119, 105. This is one you learned back, way back in vacation Bible school. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And what it's talking about is this. It will show you the right way to go. Now, if you read the Bible and you misinterpret it, that's not the Bible's fault. How many of you guys out there have ever put together a swing set? Anybody out there put together a swing set? And you get this big old box of uh, a thousand parts, all right? And you look at that thing and you say, I can do this. I don't need the instructions. <laughs> but you did it. And how many of you found out you needed the instructions? Anybody remember? You know, you, you, you got a teeter-totter that's tottering more than it's teetering, all right? And, you, and you've got a, you got a swing set that's kind of where all your, your grandkids are going to fall out on the ground, okay? And, and it's just not looking very good. And it's not very stable. Every time they go up, 
The whole thing rocks that way and you think it's going to flip over. And it's because you didn't read the instructions and you, you wound up with about 400 of those thousand parts. You still got them. You don't know where they go because you thought you knew better than the instruction. That's the way people read the Bible. They just read a little bit of it and they say, well, I got this and they don't got this and they mess up and it's not the Bible's fault. The Bible is infallible. It will not lead you astray. If you misinterpret it and you go astray, it's not the Bible's fault. How many of you get what I just talked about, okay? If you don't, I don't know how else to say it. You, you know, just talk to somebody that got it. All right, okay. Infallible. You know, authoritative. It's the authority around here. I am not the authority at Bellevue. You are not the authority at Bellevue. No staff member is the authority at Bellevue. God's Word is the authority at Bellevue. God's Word. Jesus was talking to the Jewish religious leaders of His day, and they had all their traditions. That was their authority. But Jesus said, no, the Word of God is our authority. And He said in Matthew 15, verse 3, why do you yourselves transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? You are so into your traditions, you think that's the authority. And how many times have you heard a little Baptist church somewhere, they say, well, that's just the way we've always done it. Well, so what? So what? Maybe you've been doing it wrong. Maybe your daddy was doing it wrong. Maybe your granddaddy was doing it wrong all these years. Maybe the Word of God is more true than your tradition. And take the maybe out. The Word of God is more true than your tradition. It is the truth. And it's the authority. We're going to do what the Word of God says. And the Bible is eternal. If you don't like the Bible, don't go to heaven because we're going to have Bibles up there because the Bible says the grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of our God standeth forever. That's the word akum. It stands when everybody else falls. And notice it says there, the grass withers. It's talking about people. All of us are like grass, the Bible says. We're going to wither away. And even you pretty ones out there, you flowers, you're going to fade. How many of you are feeling blessed right now? Anybody out there? All right. Oh, yeah. All of us are going to fade away. I don't believe in evolution because it says everything gets better with time. And I've told you a thousand times, I own a mirror and I know better than that. Amen. I, I'm not getting better. I don't look any better than I did. I'm not going to say anything about you. I'm not going to say everything I know, all right? But I will tell you this, even though we wither, the Word of our God stands forever. Long after Steve Gaines is gone, the Word of God will be in preached from this pulpit, amen? Because the Word of God standeth forever. Praise the Lord. I'm getting happy. The Word of God is perfect. There's nothing in this world perfect except God and the Word of God. No perfect person, but the Word is perfect. Psalm 19, verse 7, the law of the Lord is what? Say it out loud. And it restores the soul. Oh, the Word of God restores my soul. It is Christ-centered. The Bible is Christ-centered. It's all about Jesus. The Old Testament points to Jesus. The Gospels, the four Gospels talk about His earthly ministry. The book of Acts talk about His continued ministry through the power of the Holy Spirit in the early church, the early Christians, His disciples, and His apostles. And then all of the letters, all of the epistles, they clarify the doctrine that was set forth by Jesus in the Gospels. And when you get to the book of Revelation, it's about Jesus coming back. All of it points to Jesus Christ. And so Jesus said when He was talking to the Pharisees, the Jewish religious leaders, he said, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, but it is these that bear witness to me, and you're not willing to come to me that you may have eternal life. What's he saying? The Bible does not save you. The Bible points to Jesus, and Jesus saves you. Now, wait a minute. Don't, that doesn't mean it's not important because we don't know anything about Jesus except by the Bible, all right? But the book itself doesn't save you. This is the menu, Jesus is the meal, amen? amen? Jesus is the bread of life. So he's it's pointing to the one that saves you, but it's all about Jesus Christ, and it is all good. The Bible is Christ-centered, and the Bible is powerful. Hebrews 4.12, for the Word of God is alive. It is powerful. It is sharper than the two, sharpest two-edged sword cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and our desires. It is powerful enough to save anybody in this room from any sin. It can sanctify 
and make more Christ-like any Christian in this room. The Bible can set free anybody from any bondage that you have, any besetting sin. The Bible can heal anyone who is sick. The Bible leads non-Christians to salvation, help helps Christians grow in grace and become effective servants of Jesus Christ. There's no other book like the Bible, the written Word of God. So God commands us to read it every day, to hear it, preach, to study it, to memorize it, to meditate on it, to speak it, to claim it, and above all, to pray it. To pray it. All right, when it comes to praying Scripture, changing the world by praying the Word of God, Jesus is our example. He's our example. Jesus prayed on the cross three times, and two of those were Scripture. In Matthew 27, we read that He prayed Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right before He died, Jesus, in Luke 23, prayed Psalm 22. 31 verse 5, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus prayed the Word of God. The living Word of God, Jesus prayed prayed the written Word of God, the Scripture. And if Jesus prayed the Word of God, Steve's going to pray the Word of God. Jesus prayed the Word of God while He was on the cross. Number three, how do you pray Scripture? How do you pray Scripture? How do you do it? Okay. First of all, you interpret it correctly and then you personalize Scripture. Some people call this claiming a verse. Some people talk about standing on a promise. I've done this for years. I literally have, and I'm not trying to in any way put myself on a pedestal, but I, I want to tell you, I tell you the truth. I've got stacks of verses. I've been doing this for over 20 years. I have stacks of verses that the Lord has given me as promises along the way in my Christian life. I date them. I, I, I put down on the little card when I wrote the promise. I wrote down a promise that I prayed 12 years ago. I wrote it down the other day, and I came across it again, and I looked on that date. I looked in my Bible. I found exactly where I had found it. It's in this Bible that I'm reading through this year. It was the same Bible I read through several years ago, 12 years ago. I'm reading again through this year, and I saw the two connections, and I realized what was going on in my life then, why I needed that promise, and guess what? I need the same thing right now. And so I started praying that verse again. I started praying that verse. It's out of Ezekiel over in chapter 38. But anyway, I won't talk about that. But it's a wonderful thing to read the Bible and to sense that God is giving you a promise. I don't know how to tell you, but just when you're reading the Bible, I read it this morning, I read it every day, and, and, and you're not reading it to try to get a sermon. You're not reading it to try to get up a, a lesson, but you're just reading it to feed your soul. And all of a sudden, something you've been burdened about, something you've been praying about, it just speaks to you. I mean, it just comes out and you, you say, okay, what's the context? What's he saying here and everything. Now I want to personalize it. I want to take this. If he said a promise to them, I want him to say it to me. And so I take that and I begin to pray it. Now I'm going to be talking about how to do this in just a minute, but just remember that you can interpret it and you can personalize Scripture. Now let's talk for a minute about praying for your children, all right? This is where a lot of you are. Some of you don't have children, but uh, you'll be a parent hopefully one of these days. And uh, God will bless many of you with children. What do you need to pray for your children? How many of you believe our children need prayer? Anybody out there? Okay. You know, our kids are in a world that is becoming unbelievably immoral. I was on the uh, Stairmaster the other day at a place where I work out, and I I didn't turn on anything. It was just sitting right in front of me. I mean, I'm, I'm like four feet from this thing, and all of a sudden there's two women kissing on the television. I'm like, What's going on, man? What, you know, this is like prime time. Kids can see this and everything else. Look, our world is becoming increasingly open to rebellion against the Word of God. You understand what I'm saying? And, and, and it's wrong for a man and a woman who are not married to sleep together. It's wrong for two women to sleep together. It's wrong for two men to sleep together and be intimate. That's wrong in the Bible. You understand right from wrong? That's wrong. That's called sin. That's called immorality. And so I looked at it and just said, oh, Lord. And so we need to pray for our children. 
Now, one of the main things we need to pray is for maturity, maturity. And I don't know of a better verse. I prayed this verse thousands of times while our children were growing up, and now I'm praying this for our 11 grandchildren. Luke 2.52, and Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. He grew intellectually, he grew in wisdom, he grew physically, he grew in stature, he grew spiritually, he grew in favor with God, he grew socially in favor with man. So I want my children to grow like that. I went out to eat about two years ago with a guy, and he said, well, you know, now that your kids are grown, I guess you're going to ease up a little on the, on the praying. I said, what are you talking about, man? i got 11 grandbabies now, and I don't want my kids to mess up either, and I'm 60 years old, and I don't want to mess up. So I'm, gonna, I'm praying more now than I've ever prayed in my life. I'm not trying to impress you. I'm just telling you I don't want to mess up. I don't want my kids, my grown kids messing up, and I want my grandchildren, they're growing up, and all I'm going to have a cell phone and access to the Internet and all the mess that's in that and everything. I want to pray more than I've ever prayed. What am I going to pray? I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for Olivia and Weston and Camille and Sawyer and, and Ivy and Ruthie and Charlie. And I'm going to pray for Hadley and Dempsey and Emery Kate and Ainsley every day. Oh God, Jesus, I pray that they will increase, just like you did, increase in wisdom and in stature and in favor with you and with their fellow man. I'm going to say that every day until Jesus comes. I'm going to let my kids know every day Papa is praying for you. Every day I'm going to call your name out to God and I'm going to pray Scripture over you. My wife and I have claimed that verse for our children for, since 1983. Our son was born a month and a half ago, 35 years ago, and a month and a, month and a half ago. For, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Back in April is what I'm trying to say, okay. He was a month and a half old 35 years ago, and on this day, on this day, 35 years ago, I started pastoring Baptist churches, and I've been pastoring for 35 years today, and I've been praying the Word of God over my son, over all my children, and my grandchildren for the last 35 years. I also pray for salvation for my children. All of my children are saved. All of them are on their way to heaven. All of them, I'll talk about that in a minute, have married saved people. I pray John 16, verse 8, that God will convict my children of sin, righteousness, and judgment. I pray Acts 3, 19, that they will repent, therefore, and return, that their sins may be washed away, that times and seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And I pray Romans 10, 13, that the Lord will help them to call, my children, to call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Now, all my kids have been saved. Now, I'm praying this for all my grandchildren. And I want to say this to you, they're starting to get saved. i got three or four of my 11 that have already been saved. I'm praying for all of them to get saved and know the Lord. I'm also praying some other things. I'm praying for them to have spiritual growth. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3.18 that they will grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I pray that for them all the time. I pray that they'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5.18, don't get drunk with wine, that's dissipation, that's excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. That used to bother me a little bit. You know, before I started living for the Lord, back when I was a teenager, I drank some, and, and I, you know, I, when I got, I don't know, you, you may still want to drink a little bit, I, I just don't like that stuff, I, I know what it did to me, I know I, after I drank one time, I know that I would say things and do things that I wouldn't do had I not drunk just that one time. And you know, I, you, you can talk about it all you want to. Give me a Diet Coca-Cola, I'm good to go. Amen, I'm, I'm okay. I, I don't need the other. But anyway, if that's bothering you right now, good. I don't care. I don't, I'm not mad about that. But, you know, I just don't. I, but but why, why does he talk about the same verse? Don't get drunk with wine, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? If, when you get drunk, you act differently, you talk differently, you think differently, you walk differently. Isn't that right? So when you're full of the Holy Spirit, guess what? You act differently, you talk differently, you think differently, and you praise God, you walk differently. Amen? So it's really a good analogy, even though it's tough for a Baptist to handle it, all right? So we want to pray for God to fill us with the Holy Spirit. God, help me to be filled with the Holy Spirit today. And then pray for the fruit of the Spirit. When God fills you, He's going to put in you, let come out of you. I pray this a lot of times, Lord, I pray that you'll release from me today love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I want the fruit of the Spirit coming out. And if there's no fruit, it's probably because there's no root. Maybe you don't know Jesus. You need the fruit of the Spirit. And then pray 
that God will keep your children morally pure. Oh my. They've got access to the internet now. There's so much immorality on the internet, so much immorality on television, so much immorality. You know, back when I was growing up, it was like the Fred Flintstone. It was like the Beverly Hillbillies. It was like Mayberry and Barney Fife and all that, you know? It was like, you know, I could go on and on, but it was just good, fun stuff. And now there's, you can't even turn it on without adultery, fornication, homosexuality, lesbianism. It's just unbelievable. Everybody's getting killed. You're going to, to morgues and seeing bodies that have been mutilated. I'm just telling you, you can't just let your kids watch television indiscriminately. You can't do it. You cannot do it. You got to pray that they'll be morally strong and pure. Here's a verse I pray, 2 Timothy 2.22. I pray that they, my children and grandchildren will flee from youthful lust, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call upon the Lord from a pure heart. I pray that all the time. Pray for them to have direction and guidance as well in their lives. Again, Psalm 32, verse 8, that God will instruct them and teach them in the way that they should go. Pray that they will have good, godly friends. How many of you know that their friends are a big deal? Anybody know that? Look, don't pray that your kids will just hang around the popular kids. Pray that your kids will hang around the godly kids. I'd rather my kids hang around the godly kids than the popular kids if the popular kids are not living for Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, bad company corrupts good morals. Let's say that together. Bad company corrupts good morals. And that goes for you too, by the way. Your best friends need to be godly Christians. You need to have some friends where you're trying to win them to the Lord, but they're not your best friends. Your best friends, look at me, your best friends, if they're not living with the Lord, it's easier for them to pull you down than it is for you to pull them up. You let your best friends be people living for Jesus Christ. And if you've only got three good godly friends, you have a better chance of making it than with 30 that are not living for the Lord. All right, you need to pray that your kids will be taught and trained. There's, there's a difference. Taught is when they're verbally instructed. Trained is when they are given an example. And the Bible says in Ephesians 6 verse 4 that you are to teach and to train your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Pray for them also to have respect for God-ordained authority. Oh, man, this is huge. Parents, make them honor and obey you. Don't let them talk back to you. Don't let them scream at you. And under the Lord, don't you dare let them hit you. You let them hit you when they're two, they'll be really hitting you when they're 20. I'm telling you, you need to be on top of this. You have got to win this. You are not just their buddy, you are their parent. And they don't have anybody else that can be their parent. Please, don't let them despise Godly ordained authority. When their teacher says they did wrong, don't take your child's side. Take the teacher's side. Oh, oh no, my baby would never do it. Yes, they will. <laughs> you did too. You messed up too. Oh, it couldn't be my child. Yeah. Your child's got sin in their life. They've got a sin nature. And don't you be taking uh, that all the time, taking the, the teachers to task all the time. They don't make any money anyway, hardly at all. I tell you what, we need to pay our teachers more and respect them more and respect people in authority more. Amen. Amen. And then pray for your children's children. This is huge. Wow. I've been doing this for years. Isaiah 59 verse 21 says, that the Spirit of God upon you and the Word of God in your mouth will not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your children, nor from the mouth of your children's children. I pray for several generations every day. Here's how I pray. God, I pray for my grandkids. I, I, I pray for my children. I pray for all my grandkids. Do it by name. And I pray, dear God, in the name of Jesus, that uh, the, word, the Spirit of God that's upon me and Donna and the Word of God that's in our mouth will not depart from our mouths, nor from the mouths of our children, and nor from the mouths of our children's children. Father, I pray for all of my grandchildren that they will marry godly, 
spirit-filled people, not just Christians that go to church, but godly, spirit-filled people who have parents who will be godly, spirit-filled in-laws because they're going to be the grandparents of my grandchildren. You know, I want them to be godly too. And then, Lord, I want them to have godly, spirit-filled children who will marry godly, spirit-filled people who have godly, spirit-filled parents on and on until Jesus comes, Lord. Let the whole trajectory of the Gaines family love Jesus Christ. I pray that every day, every day. Pray the Word of God over my children. And Isaiah 59, verse 21 is the best one I know. Number five, pray for your spouse. Oh, my marriage is not good. Are you praying for your spouse? No, I'm just telling them what they ought to do. That ain't going to work. How's that, how's that working for you? Is that working real good? Well, he just won't listen. Well, maybe he'll listen to God. And maybe it's not your, God, your job to teach him. Maybe it's not your job to teach her. Maybe you ought to pray about it more than just constantly telling them what's wrong with them. It's getting quiet in here. <laughs> Husbands, here's what you ought to pray. Pray for yourself that you will love your wife. Ephesians 5, 25, like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Pray 1 Peter 3, 7. I pray this every day. Lord, help me to love my wife. Let me, help me love Donna like Christ loved the church, gave himself for it. Love her like my own. Let me love her like my own body. Let me love her like myself. And 1 Peter 3, 7. Let me live with her in an understanding way as with a delicate vessel. That's what the word asthenia means, a weak vessel, delicate vessel, as with a weaker vessel so that my prayers will not be hindered. Lord, I don't want my prayers hindered. If I'm not praying for my wife, dear God, if I'm not living with her in an understanding, kind, loving way, you're not going to answer my prayers. You're not going to do it. Why do, you think, why do you think the devil is attacking your marriage so that he can mess up your prayers so that you won't live for God? So you got to live with God. you got to pray these scriptures back to God all the time and say, God, I want to do right. You wives should be praying, not that God will change your husband, no, that God will change you. God will change you, that you will, according to Ephesians 5.22, submit to your husband as under, your, under the Lord. Ephesians 5.33, you'll respect him. 1 Corinthians 11.13, you'll acknowledge him as the God-ordained leader and the head of your home under Christ. And then at 1 Corinthians 11.9, you will be your husband's helper. God will bless you if you will pray Scripture, ladies. Number six, married couples should pray also in some other areas. This will help you. Now look, anybody in here married, this will help you. And if you're thinking about getting married, you need to know this. Pray for God's protection over your marriage and your home. The devil is out to destroy your marriage. He is out to make you constantly think bad things about your spouse. Don't give in to the devil. I pray this every day, Psalm 91, verses 10 through 11. Lord, I pray that no evil will befall us, no plague will come near this dwelling, our home. Give your angels charge concerning us to guard us in all of your ways. I got news for you. I walk around with angelic protection all around me all the time. I walk around. Nothing can get to me unless it gets through the hand of God. Amen? Because I'm praying all the time for protection. Because the Bible says, unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. You said, don't worry about it, Brother Steve. I've got a shotgun. Don't worry about it, Brother Steve. I've got a little alarm system. You can have all of that and not have protection because you can't keep the devil out except through the Word of God and praying the Word of God. The devil can come past your little shotgun. He can come past your little alarm. He's not worried about that. If you're living in sin, the devil can take you down. But if you're walking with God, no demon in hell can come against your family. I'm telling you, you need to start praying the Word of God over your family that you'll have protection. I pray every day that we won't have car wrecks, that we, our houses won't bro be broken into, that our cars won't be broken into, that we won't fall and trip. I, you just be surprised what all I pray. I, I get real specific about all that, about God's protection. Pray that God will bless your finances as you're a giver. The Bible says in Malachi 3.10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. If you do, God, he said, T test me down this. If you'll do that, he says, I'll open the windows of heaven pour out a blessing until it overflows. More about that in a minute. Pray that God will supply all of your needs according to His riches through glory in Christ Jesus. Pray that, 
that uh, Romans 8, 32, he who did not spare your own son, his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with Jesus freely give you all things? Pray third John 2, that in all, all respects you will prosper, be in good health just as your soul prospers. I pray over our finances every day that God will protect us. Pray for God's presence in your home, that when people come in your home, they literally sense the presence of God. A great verse is Psalm 1611, in your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. I pray for good health over my family all the time. 3 John 2 is my go-to verse. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper, be in good health, even as your soul prospers. You say, how do you pray that, Brother Steve? I say, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus. I just name the people in my family. I pray that in all respects they will prosper. They'll be in good health just as their souls prosper. Now you say, do you all never get sick? Once in a while we do, but you know what? We pray for God to heal, either through medicine, miracle, or both. How many of you believe we ought to pray for healing? Anybody believe that out there? Sure we should. God is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. And then pray for harmony and unity in the family. The devil's always trying to stir up stink. He's always trying to divide the family. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He is a divider in churches. He's a divider in the Southern Baptist Convention. He is a divider in our nation. He's the one that's trying to get us all mad at each other all the time. And he's the one stirring up stuff in your marriage all the time. He does it all the time. And you've got to fight it with prayer, praying for unity and harmony. Psalm 133 verse 1 says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers, and I believe you can apply that to your marriage, to dwell together in unity. Another thing that, that my wife says is a silver bullet. If you want to raise a godly family, this is a key. Have meals at home. Pray that God will help you guard your meal times for family interaction. Read about it in Psalm 128 that your wife is at the table and the man is at the table and all your children are around the table and you don't, look, turn the cell phones off. Turn all the tablets off. Turn all the televisions off. Disconnect from the world. Connect with one another around mealtime. It is a silver bullet if you want to have a godly family. I promise you, this is what, what we used to do is this. We would take our calendars a month or two out, and every week we would put down three nights where we were going. And look, we had baseball. We had all kinds of cheerleading. We had so much stuff going on with four kids. But every week, four, three nights a week, we would eat together. I don't care if you have to eat beanie weenies. It doesn't matter, all right? You eat it doesn't matter what you eat, just eat together, not out in some restaurant where everybody's, you know, spread out, looking at everybody, but at home. Eat at home three nights a week. Just look, just try that. I promise you, you're going you're gonna to learn what your kids are thinking. You're going to get involved in their life. You just say a little bit to a child. They'll start opening up about friendships, about what's going on in their lives, and you will know more about your children if you'll do that. And what happens is then when somebody calls you up and says, hey, we're going to do something Friday or Thursday night, say, you know what, I've already got a commitment. You don't even have to tell them what it is. You don't even have to tell them what it is. Your family is more important than doing all this other stuff for everybody else. Stay home with your children. Stay home with your children and interact with them. Talk with them. Listen to them. It's huge. And uh, pray for God's guidance. We've already talked a lot about that. I, Isaiah 30, verse 21 is a great, uh, you families, you couples who pray together, you're going to stay together because God is going to guide you. There's, Isaiah 30, verse 21 says, Lord, I pray that I will hear your voice behind me saying, this is the way, walk in it whenever I turn to the right or to the left. God's going to show me what to do. I'm going to pray for guys. Now, pray for your church. Pray for your church. Local churches need prayer today more than ever. And my favorite verse to pray, a general blessing just a general blessing over a church is Acts 9.31. So the church throughout all Judea, Galilee, Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up, going on the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they continue to increase. Now let me pray slowly and show you how I pray for Bellevue. Bellevue, Bellevue Bay of Vista, Bellevue Frazier, where my kids are pastoring and ministering. I pray for Prince Avenue Baptist Church where uh, uh, Ryan has just gone. He's my son-in-law married to my oldest daughter. I pray for First Baptist Poto, Oklahoma. Uh, the, the Prince Avenue is in Athens, Georgia. I pray for First Baptist Poto, Oklahoma, where my 
son-in-law married to my middle daughter is a pastor i pray for right up the road here calvary baptist church where my son is the pastor in jackson tennessee i pray for all those churches every day this verse and it is acts 9 31 lord i pray that all these churches will enjoy peace be built up go on in the fear of you the comfort of the holy spirit they will continue to increase put the verse on the screen real quick now watch you watch lord i pray that and i name the churches i do it by name I pray that they will enjoy peace, be built up, go on in the fear of you, the comfort of the Holy Spirit. They will continue to increase. How many of you think you could do that? Anybody think you could do it? Why don't you start praying that verse for Bellevue Baptist Church and watch what God does. The more we pray and the more people that pray, the greater the blessing. Where prayer focuses, God's power falls. And we want to pray for our church. We want to be built up and go on in the fear of the Lord. Pray also that we will be a house of prayer. Jesus talked about that in Isaiah 56, verse 7. I pray that verse all the time. Jesus quoted Isaiah 56, verse 7 when he cleansed the temple. And I pray it all the time. I said, Lord, I pray that, that all of us, Lord, even now, Lord, our sacrifices and our offerings will be acceptable in your sight that we will be a house of prayer for all the nations, dear God. Let Bellevue Baptist Church be a house of prayer. Let us be a house of prayer for all the nations. And that's coming from Isaiah 56, verse 7. Pray that we will have spirit-anointed worship. All is vain unless the spirit of the Holy One comes down. Acts 4, 31, when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak the Word of God with boldness. I pray that verse... For our church. I pray today that we would be filled with the Holy Spirit as we worship. Pray for your pastor that he will devote himself to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. Acts 6 4. Pray that I will study to show myself approved unto God, to be a workman who does not need to be ashamed, that I might rightly divide the Word of Truth. 2 Timothy 2 15. If you'll pray more for me, I will preach better, I promise you, all right? And part of it will be because if you pray for me, you'll listen better, all right? And then pray for every member that we will share Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 4, 19, if you don't have a desire to share Christ, pray for one. Say, Father, you said, Jesus, you said in Matthew 4, 19, that if I would follow you, I'll be a fisher for men. Lord, help me to fish for men's souls. I was over in Arkansas this week. We took a few days off. It was so nice to be over there. We went to a little marina. And there were a couple of boys that were working there, teenage boys. Uh, one of them was 19, I think, and one of them was 22. They were, well, he wasn't a teenager, but right at it. And so I got to witness to both of them, one on one day, one on the other. You say, how do you witness to them? I talk to them until I ask them this question. I say, do you go to church? And now all of a sudden that changes everything. And they say, well, I hadn't been going to church very much. Both of them said that to me on different days. And I said, well, you know, I used to be like that. And then I share my testimony about how I got, got saved. And then I share with them Christ. I say, you know, God loves you, but you're a sinner like all of us. We've all sinned. We come short of the glory of God. But God, nevertheless, loves you, and he wants you to know him. And that's why he sent Jesus. There's nothing like Christianity. Jesus came to us. All the other religions, you're trying to work your way up to God. But Jesus saw we'd never make it, so he came down to you. And I just shared that with him out there on a boat dock on a boat dock while they're filling up with gas while I'm paying four dollars a gallon for gas amen for in the boat and I'm just saying uh, Lord I'm witnessing please let this thing hurry up and fill up all right but anyway I, I'm witnessing and saying you know Jesus died for you he rose from the dead to give you eternal life and if you'll repent of your sins believe in Jesus and call upon his name I'm doing this real fast I didn't say it this fast he, you'll do that he'll save you have you ever done that they said well i've done that i'm just not living for the lord so I, i've got both of their addresses i'm going to mail them some materials why do i do that why am i talking to you about that because i don't want to tell you to do something i don't do i want to tell people about jesus and i'll be frank with you i love to preach to you i love to talk with you i love all this but i there is nothing more precious than to share with one individual one-on-one -on -one and lead them to faith in christ jesus so I want to do that. I want to be a soul winner. I don't want to get to heaven having not won anybody to the Lord. And you can do the same thing. And then pray that you will discover and use your spiritual gifts. When you got saved, God downloaded into you the Holy Spirit, and with the Spirit came a spiritual gift, at least one. You've got it. You need to find it. Use it for the glory of God to edify believers and to build up the church and to strengthen the, the work of the Lord. And then 
pray that God will raise up laborers to go out and work in the harvest of souls to be one and disciple. Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Beseech the Lord, beg the Lord to send out laborers into the harvest. And then pray that God's members will give tithes and offerings so the church financials need will be met. I do not like fundraisers in a church. I don't like churches selling things to raise money for the church. You don't go to the world to get money for the Lord's work. God's money is with God's people, and God's people ought to bring the whole tithe into the church. How can you trust God with your eternal soul and not 10% of your money? I just ask you a question. How can you do that? You can't. The first thing, when you get a paycheck, first thing you do, at least 10% goes to the church. God's church, your church, where you worship. And then, from there on in, you're with God. You live within your means. You pay your debts. You don't owe everybody all the town. You don't just go shopping all the time. You don't need half the stuff you got right now. Why do you need some more? So just, just back off that stuff. Don't eat out all the time. Don't live above your means. Live within a budget. If you don't have one, get a budget. Aim your money and give to other people. Save some money for future needs. Pay as you go. Don't owe everybody in town. And watch what God does. God will start opening the windows of heaven when you put Him first. When you put Him first in the day when you pray. When you put Him first with your finances. I'm telling you, God knows how to do finances more than you. And He can increase you more than you've ever dreamed. I'm not talking about getting rich. I'm not talking about, you know, driving humongous cars and all that stuff. I'm just saying God will meet your needs and give you enough to have a little bit left over to share with other people if you'll do it God's way. Amen? Amen. So just start praying. Just start praying and say, God, I'm going to do it your way. I'm tired of doing it my way. My way is not working, so I'm going to pray, God, and I'm going to pray for tithes and offerings to come into the church. Not too many amens there, so I'm going to press on. All right, okay. But I believe, how many of you believe, you believe what I just said? Anybody believe it? All right, let's do it. Okay, let's pray that members will grow in maturity in Christ's likeness, that we'll be more like Jesus, and pray that we will walk in symphony. We will walk harmoniously with one another. Now, let's pray, let's also always be praying for the salvation of lost people. <laughs> I just now looked at my watch. We're almost at, we're way past time. I'm sorry. I looked at my watch. It said, you need to breathe. I, I think I'm breathing pretty good, buddy. All right. You go back down in that hole. Give me my time. All right. Great. Okay. How do you pray for lost people? For conviction, conversion, and a contact. Pray that they'll be convicted by the Holy Spirit. Pray that they'll be saved. And you've got the verses there. And pray that somebody will tell them about Jesus and be willing to be that contact. Be willing to be the one that does it. And then pray. You got it? How many of you got that? Anybody got Everybody got it? Okay, here's the last thing. Pray for revival in our nation. I do this every day. Pray for three things. These are the keys to revival. Humility, hunger, and holiness. And they all come from 2 Chronicles 7.14. And we'll give you just a second and we're going to pray it. When you got it, stand up. Humility, hunger, and holiness. All right, let's pray this promise back to God. And my people who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, heal their land. We'll keep it on the screen now. What's the first part? My people who are called by my name will humble themselves. We've got to be humble. 
We'll never have revival if we don't humble ourselves before the Lord. If we humble ourselves, He will exalt us at the proper time. And then humility, hunger. We pray and seek His face. Oh God, more than we want the stock market to go up, more than we want more things, more than we want our football teams and all this to win. God, we want you to send revival to our nation. We are hungry for a movement of God. And then holiness, turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. And Christians, is, that's how we apply that. All Christians should be praying that. Now let's just go back to John 15, 7. Let's read this together. Here we go. Let's read it. Jesus is talking to us. Read it out loud, good and strong with me. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. How many of you are going to, you say, Lord, I want to abide in you and I want your word to abide in me. And I want to ask and I want you to do things, Lord. I want to see mountains move. Okay, let's go to Ephesians 6, 17 and 18 very quickly. Read it with me. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Now, I want you to think about what we've done the last two weeks. How many of you here last week? Anybody here last week? Okay, now look at me. Last week, I gave you the pattern. You know, all the different kinds of prayers, praise, thanksgiving, confession, all that stuff. This that I'm talking about here is primarily in the petition and intercession part. Petition, you're asking God to supply your needs. Intercession, you're asking God to meet the needs of others. If you'll start taking the Word of God, now you can use the Word of God in praise, you can use the Word of God in thanksgiving, in other parts, but I really want to encourage you to do it in the intercession and petition. If you'll start praying the Word of God, you're going to see explosive growth in your prayer time. I'm giving you how to fill in the content. How do you get the verses? You read the Bible until it burns in your heart a promise. And you write that down on a little prayer card and you start praying it back to God. You got a rebellious child? Just start praying over them. Verses. I can remember when my son was going through about two years. It was terrible. I laugh about it now. I wept about it then. I wept. I prayed. It was horrible. It was horrible. But I believe praying the Word of God brought him out of that miry clay, set his foot on a rock, put a new song in his heart, and he's preaching the Word of God today. Amen? Amen. Preaching the Word of God today. Amen. Amen. I don't take any credit for it. It's all God. It's all the Word. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, what I'm sharing with you today can change your life. Change your life. Okay. All right. I'm not through, but I'll stop. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless these sweet people. God, let us get it. Let somebody get it today, Lord. And start praying Scripture in the pattern of the Lord's Prayer for the glory of God. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. If you don't know the Lord, there's a great prayer for you to pray. Jesus, forgive me. <laughs> I repent. I want to be saved. And if you do that today, I want to ask you to do that. We're going to sing one more song. You say, well, there's all this stuff down there I can't get across. Yes, you can. There's a great divide right here, okay? And you can come right through here, and you can, you can come give your heart to Christ. We'll have pastors at every one of the, the uh, uh, walkways there, and they'll take the Word of God and show you how to be saved. Ladies, we know you want to talk with a lady. We get that. But you come talk with our pastors. They'll put you with a lady and make sure that happens. If you need to be saved, come. If you've never been baptized since you've been saved, come. Set up a time to get baptized. You want to join a church that believes in praying scripture, that's Bellevue Baptist Church, you come. And if you just need something else, you got a need, you come. We're not in a hurry. we got all day for you. All you people on the balcony, great group up there, all you on this right, you'll go to that banner that says Savior. All the ones on this side, you'll go to the one that says Way. All of you down here, you'll come this way. I don't know what you got going on this afternoon, but I want to say this to you. If you will do what God wants you to do right now, 
whole trajectory of your future and your family that you leave behind will be affected in the right way. This is a serious moment. Don't think about this afternoon. Don't think about tomorrow. Be all in. Wherever your feet are, be all in. Especially right now. The Lord rebuked me just now. I was just running through the invitation. Just saying what I normally say. And the Spirit of God just spoke to me. It's a matter of life and death for some of these people out here. Some of you are about to really go through a hard time if you don't learn how to pray. And some of you can come out of a hard time if you'll learn how to pray. Some of you are on the brink of disaster. But if you'll learn to pray, God will change it all. How many of you want Him to change it all? I want Him to change it all. I want Him to change it all. Somebody asked me, are you concerned about the Southern Baptist Convention? Well, yeah. We're fussing, we're fighting. Am I worried about the meeting next week? No, because I've been praying about it for months. And I believe God's going to do so. I believe God's going to show up in Dallas, Texas. Amen. I believe God's going to show up and show off. But I've been praying about it. I've been praying the Word of God about it. I've been praying about it. You pray with me. Right now is all we got. Southern Baptist Convention may never meet. Jesus may come back. Now's the time to pray. Now's the time to get right with God. All right? We're going to sing. And we're going to wait on the Lord. You need to come. You come. Father, in the name of Jesus, let your will be done. We love you because you first loved us in Jesus' name. Amen. Come out of sadness from wherever you live. Come. Come broken heart. Let the rescue begin. Come. Oh sinner, come near. Earth has no sorrow, heaven can heal. Earth has no sorrow, heaven can heal. I don't care what you've done, Jesus will forgive you. Come on. Lay down your burden. Lay down your burden.
Thank the Lord for being with us today. Amen. You know, the Lord has really given you a beautiful thing today. I'm not talking about my, how great my sermon. No, no, no. God taught you how to pray, pray Scripture. I can't do it for you. But I'm just going to tell you, this is where I live. You, you want to know where my source is? It's not from all that seminary stuff. I'm grateful for all that. But that's not where the power is. This is where the power is. You got mountains to move. This is the way you move them. You got stuff in your past for God to change. This is how you get it all changed. I can't, I just almost can't stop. I'm just telling you, I am so committed to this. I am so, such a believer in what I've shared with you today. This is not just a little sermon for me. I'm sharing with you my life. I'm telling you, this is where you find the victory. This is where you go to another level. This is where you come out of just visiting churches and all that stuff. Praise God for all these people coming here. Praise the living God. Amen. Hallelujah. Good to have y'all. Amen. Bless y'all. Amen. So, all right. Uh, if you're a guest, we want to give you a Bellevue gift bag at every doorway if you don't have one is a bulletin to the right of that bulletin is a little piece of paper that says let's get acquainted fill it out tear it off as you exit if you need to go on we understand uh, there are welcome tables hand them that they'll give you your Bellevue gift bag no questions asked glad you're here come back if you got a minute I'd love to meet you back at guest central right back here and we'll give you a Bible promise book plus your Bellevue gift bag if you're interested in knowing more about Bellevue, we're going to have a free lunch right back here. Now, if all you heard was free lunch there, don't come. <laughs> okay. But if you're interested in knowing more about Bellevue, if you're kicking the tires, wanting to know about how we operate, what our vision is, we're going to have that right back here. We'll, you know, if we have to you know, spread the food out, we'll do it. But if you want to come back, it'll be in the guest central right now. We'd love to. You'll learn more about Bellevue in that hour, and you, it's free, and it's a fun time. We'd love to have you right back here in what we call Guest Central. Watch this video, and Brother Drew will close us out. Didn't our singers do a good day today? Didn't they do a good job? Yeah. Thanks for watching. Ready for the best summer ever? Bellevue wants this summer to be the best one yet, and we're providing you with the ways to make it Christ-centered and family-focused. Camp Outrageous starts tomorrow, and you don't want to miss it. Bring your kids ages four years old through fifth grade and join the fun by volunteering. Registration is free, so sign up today at campoutrageous.org. And on Sunday, June 10th, Dr. Charles Lowry will preach in our morning service. His unique background as a psychologist and his easy style of humor make him one of the most sought after speakers in America. Head over to our Home Point Resource Center for a list of fun activities for you and your family to do together. Don't forget to visit bellevue.org slash summer for additional resources and information. All right, we start getting ready for Camp Outrageous. Uh, the service tonight is going to be in the fellowship hall. They'll be in here practicing and getting things set up, so sign up for that. Also, this Wednesday night, there'll be no activities on our campus because of Camp Outrageous. 
you be praying for us. If you wanted to make a decision but you did not, we're going to be down front. You come down. Uh, we'd love the opportunity to speak with you. Let me pray for you, and then we will be dismissed. Lord, we thank you for the Word of God. And, Lord, I pray that we treasure it in a greater way. May we pray it. Lord, may we believe on it. May we be obedient to what you call us to do. Now go with us in Jesus' name. Amen.